Welcome everybody to this important topic, as I was just mentioning. Um, this is IFMA Boston Chapters Airside Sterilization for Safer Post-COVID-19 Building Occupancy, brought to you by Think Tank. Um, today's moderator, Bob Persichini from NV5. Thank you as well, Bob. Uh, we have on the panel today, Alan Olette from Filter Sales Services, Inc., as well as Mindy Espinoza from Ultra Violet Devices, Inc., and Bill Gray from Global Plasma Solutions. So thank you to our panel. Also, I'd just like to add everyone, if you have questions throughout the presentation, please put them in the chat and we will have them answered um, appropriately at the end of the presentation. And we are recording, as we mentioned, so please put your um, cameras on mute. Thank you very much. And, uh, Bob, take it away. Thank you. I'd like to um, welcome you all here. Uh, this presentation you'll find to be uh, real interesting and each one of these topics could take more than an hour. So we're sort of condensing it, giving you a, a little bit of um, information. And if you should need some more, um, please feel free to reach out to the uh, speakers. So one of the things, um, <clears throat> one of the questions that we've been being asked a lot is what is the cost effective options available for modifying my building's air handling system so they can provide a more sterile environment for my occupants after this current pandemic is over. As you all are aware, um, there's a lot of testing and a lot of information being um, put out there and it's a very fluid situation and um, we get new guidance every day. So how is COVID-19 transmitted? Well, it's through uh, droplets and aerosols. Uh, you can see here the illustration with the infected individual um, coughing and um, it becomes airborne uh, and there are droplets and they also go down to contaminated surfaces. So um, what you're going to be hearing about in the future uh, from some of the um, other speakers is the size of microns and so forth and how the filtration will affect them. All right, so how is COVID-19 transmitted? Um, so indoor humidity uh, has, has a role with it. You probably have heard where they want you to, to increase humidity within the space above 60%. Um, there is a little bit of an issue with that based on the construction of the facility, uh, whether or not you have um, um, the right type of construction with vapor barriers and if you have um, uh, humidity control actually in your systems. Uh, most office environments do not. A lot of hospitals and specialty areas uh, do have humidity control. The ventilation rates, um, adding more outdoor air, more air changes and so forth uh, into the space is, uh, is, is also another way to uh, increase the uh, cleanliness of the air within the space, and we'll be talking about that. So a few uh, ASHRAE press releases that are out there. Um, so the ASHRAE position document on infectious um, aerosols, those um, were, was, I believe in April of um, 14th of 2020. Um, and then they got some relationships between COVID-19 and HVAC buildings, which was back in May. Um, same with the building readiness reopening guidance. And then hot off the presses, reopening schools and universities. So if you refer back to, to um, the ASHRAE website, you'll see a, a lot of guidance that they've put together. Uh, they have a number of committees 
within the um, ASHRAE organization working on specific things. And you'll probably be seeing releases coming out daily. Um, this, the role of air distribution within the building, uh, I'm on TC 5.3, which is air distribution, and our committee is going through reviewing how air is distributed into the space and how it is exhausted out of the space and what it actually, um, how it behaves within the space based on the type of air diffusers and so forth that you have. So, um, you know, there's the fully mixed, there's the partially mixed, and the stratified um, type of systems, and the definitions and so forth are all below that, which you can look at in your, at your leisure. A, um, a study that was done, um, and it shows here, and, and there's a lot of text that goes with this, but essentially, we had a patient at table TB um, who um, actually um, sneezed and it went through the zone, the ABC zone there of TA and TC. And um, as you, um, there's an air handling unit that is sitting over here where my cursor is. And you'll see what happens as the pathogens get picked up by the air handling unit and gets distributed back out into the space and so forth. So a number of these individuals that were in this air zone did, did get sick where people out here in this other um, area and not in the air zone did not. So um, we, we know that the um, various pathogens will get airborne and, um, and will get distributed back through the space. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alan, who will talk about the filtration rules. I believe he's on mute. All right, Alan, you got it? Joy, I think you can right click on Alan and unmute him manually. Is that better? Much better. Thank you. Um, so I'm here to talk about the role of air filtration in reducing the risk of infectious respiratory illnesses such as our current uh, pandemic. Uh, I probably get several calls a day here, people just wanting to order a HEPA filter for their air conditioning system. And of course, it's a lot more complicated than that and most air conditioning systems, HVAC systems won't accommodate a HEPA filter. So we'll talk about the various efficiencies of filtration products available, talk about some of the pressure drops and what they do and some of the caveats to the efficiency ratings. Hopefully I can get this to change. So what All right, okay. there are about uh, uh, 800 million viruses per square meter of land, of course, and not all viruses have any effect on human health. Most don't, and some are even essential to life. But a recent variation of the coronavirus has been identified, of course, as a respiratory illness disease, and we now know it as COVID-19. Um, the CDC determined that this spreads primarily through from person to person, and although it can be sometimes physical contact, most of it is respiratory droplets. And those can range between a half micron up to 15 micron. And studies have suggested uh, for this particular virus, a particle as small as one micron is capable of carrying enough virus to infect a person, which is probably the reason why it is so contagious and, and everybody's wearing masks and so forth. Um, the good news and bad news is that the smaller a particle gets, um, the longer it stays suspended in the air. So in normal air filtration, we sort of like the fact that small particles stay suspended so we have time to pull them through an air handler uh, or an air filtration system. But uh, of course for this, um, you know, a half micron particle can stay suspended for up to 19 hours. And even larger uh, 15 micron particle may stay up there for eight to 10 minutes. 
So uh, they stay airborne, and so they very easily, as Bob had mentioned, can, can be carried back to the air filtration system. Do I get this to? Oh, oh, sorry about that. You got to go to resume, right? So um, the um, air filter efficiencies uh, are had are gotten by the ASHRAE standard fifty two two. So you probably all heard uh, people talking about MERV ratings. Okay. So air Thanks, filter John. efficiency. Yeah. No problem. Air filter efficiencies are determined under ASHRAE standard 52, uh, resulting in a MERV rating or minimum reported value, minimum efficiency reported value. Um, and under standard risk areas um, in COVID, the efficiency um, recommended, uh, especially for particles in the range of 0.5 to 15 or so, is MERV 13 to MERV 15 or 16. So MERV 13 or higher. Uh, is the rating um, that has been asked for. Um, and this is for normal office buildings, public buildings, and so forth. Hospital guidelines have always required MERV 14 or higher. So um, it is known that uh, generally small particles that are of, of respiratory concern uh, are handled pretty effectively by these filters. Um, so uh, the caveat I would probably make is that not all uh, MERV ratings and MERV rated filters are the same. Uh, so what we find, especially trying to respond to uh, leads, uh, because leads registration is always requested in MERV 13, and often people only have one or two inch filter racks, the uh, industry responded with developing uh, pleated filters, one, two, and four inch pleated filters that were MERV 13. In order to get products like that, with uh, pressure drops that are acceptable to various size HVAC units, especially the smaller ones where you might only have uh, ex external static ability of three quarters of an inch or something, uh, they had to start using medias that were slightly electrostatically charged. So, uh, and that's almost all the uh, MERV 13 pleated filters and even sometimes the larger secondary filters have uh, mechanical uh, electrostatic charges put in. But what happens uh, during the ASHRAE test, that charge is in effect, because an ASHRAE test only takes probably a half a day. But uh, when you get into real life applications after about a week in use, the, the particles put into that filter and moisture and everything else, the charge is negated. And it's not unusual for a MERV rating to drop by one or, two MERV, one or two MERV ratings. So a 13 would likely drop to a MERV 11 or 12. Um, so knowing that, ASHRAE came back and they studied uh, that aspect of filtration. They were promising people minimum efficiency reported value. So they finally came up with an, an appendix to the test uh, called Appendix J, which a filter uh, will then be discharged and tested and a person can ask for a MERV A rated filter, filter that's been discharged and then tested. And we're big advocates for that, especially as you're talking about uh, disease control and so forth, that you wanna know that your MERV 13 filter is MERV 13 from, one, from day one on, and it's not charging, especially in hospital applications and so forth. So I just wanted to make you aware of it. In almost all the pleated filters, you're going to get an electrostatically charged material. There's not much you can do about it. Uh, when you get into the secondary type filters, 12 inch deep filters, you have more choice. Uh, let me get this to switch. So the ASHRAE um, test standard uh, takes all the filters um, and categorizes them in these general categories. And you can see that MERV 13 uh, down at the bottom here uh, starts in the one to three micron range is greater than 90% efficient and so forth on up. So uh, that is the range of filters that starts to have the largest effect on health. That is why um, the build, building council and LEADS registration requires that. And that's why it's been effectively recommended for a remediation of some of the risk of COVID. 
Um, and the filter's efficiency is only good as the supporting hardware it's put into. So we talked about the discharging of some of these pleated filters and so forth. Um, but on top of that, quite often you're sliding those filters into filter tracks or racks that aren't gasketed. Uh, they do have a higher pressure drop associated with them. So any sort of bypass around that filter is going to be greater. So um, one of the things that we recommend is that you look at uh, the type of filter hardware that you're putting, you know, that sliding that filter into and try to gasket between filters um, and so forth. If you have pushing frames, make sure they're properly gasketed. Um, pressure drop also is greater with these filters, so you have to make sure that your air handler can handle it. Uh, usually in the, uh, you know, two to five ton range, you've got to be real careful because they have sort of limited fan capacities. Um, and after that, uh, we're generally okay. But you have to also keep in mind that um, pressure drop equals money. So um, the more horsepower required to push air through a filter, the more you're going to spend on uh, energy. Uh, I wanted to mention antimicrobial treated filters because there's so much misunderstanding about those. Um, they can have some um, uh, benefit in certain applications with mold and so forth, but they do absolutely nothing uh, for things that, like this virus. Um, said the fibers are treated so that if you have moisture and you have direct contact with the fiber, that'll stop mold and other things from growing, but it really doesn't pertain to what we're talking about here. Uh, the other thing, if you're using other purification technologies, such as the following two speakers, uh, they're, they're important and they are used in conjunction with filters more often. Um, you have to have, you have to be aware of some of the issues. For instance, um, uh, UVC, if it's shining directly on synthetic filters, can be damaging to those filters. So it's better to protect them somehow or move to a different type of uh, material in the filters. Um, and then I think in the needlepoint ionization also, there's certain times where if you're unloading right into a filter, it may dissipate some of the ions. So there are things you need to take care of if you're gonna be using other technologies in conjunction. Uh, I put this up here so you could just see some of the typical pressure drops of filters that you might be converting to. And you can see, for instance, in the normal two inch filter range, at 500 feet per minute, uh, you're at about uh, 0.37 inches water column. Normal pleated filter is probably about 0.25. So you're, you know, substantially higher. Uh, most uh, applications can take it. Uh, if you're using a one inch MERV 13 filter, I wouldn't push it over 300 feet per minute uh, because you get very high in pressure drop. And um, so, so I just wanted people to sort of be aware of that. Uh, these filters are available. They're probably about twice the price of a normal MERV-8 rated filter, so there is a um, cost to them also. As you get up into more sophisticated products, um, and especially if you get into the newer technologies, uh, you'll find that you can move up to the MERV-13 and higher ranges uh, very easily without too much problem pressure drop-wise. Uh, V-Bank HEPA filters are offered through most manufacturers now, and they, uh, MERV 13 will start as low as 0.27, and um, they go up high, as high as 0.33. Uh, MERV 14 isn't that much greater than that, so you can actually pop in a MERV 14. And these filters will typically have a, a two-year lifespan, so some of the extra cost with them is, is mitigated by the fact that you're not changing them as often. Uh, bag filters, there's some newer technology bag filters, fine fiber. These are all MERV A rated products. Uh, again, a two year product. It's a MERV A13, a MERV A14, or a MERV A15. Uh, very reasonable to use in those systems. For people that have compact space and want to get into um, higher efficiencies, some of the mini pleat filters that are offered on the market nowadays also can be MERV A rated. Uh, they will come with a higher pressure drop, so you do have to be a little bit careful. The, the four-inch pleated filters are typically a one-inch type product, a one, um, one-inch or one-year type filter life. Um, the higher risk categories, um, you know, for hospitals, people, areas where people may actually have the COVID-19 uh, virus, or people that are uh, close by with Im immune compromisation, uh, HEPA filtration is recommended. Um, HEPA filters are not tested under this ASHRAE standard 52.2. That's a design test. You test one filter and then you build 
tens of thousands without testing them. Uh, almost every HEPA filter or most of the major manufacturers comes off the line and goes right um, to a test station where it's tested for its most penetrating particle size. You'll hear that term MPPS. The typical HEPA is 0.3 micron MPPS. So that's the particle size most likely to go through that. And they make sure they test with a 0.3 micron particle and make sure that it's 99.97% or higher before it leaves the factory. Uh, again, you got to look at your system's hardware. We have people that call up and yes, we can build a HEPA filter to go into a slide track um, and various uh, ASHRAE frames, but a HEPA filter by nature is meant to have an airtight seal. It's filtering 0.3 micron products. You got to have seals that also sustain that efficiency. So typically it's different type of hardware. There's all sorts of retrofit kits that you can get to do that. Uh, in, larger HEPA, in larger applications, it's very practical to do. Um, but again, you got to get the right hardware. And uh, pay, paying attention to the pressure drop of a HEPA filter, it's significantly higher than anything in the ASHRAE field. So uh, there's going to be some extra energy consumption. You got to make sure your fan capacity can uh, handle it. So uh, putting HEPA filters in an HVAC, HVAC system will certainly uh, reduced to almost zero the risk of transferring stuff through the uh, air system. However, uh, often the house air conditioning and HVAC systems only giving you about six air changes an hour. Um, so to supplement that sometimes with self-contained air purifiers in rooms, uh, self-contained uh, UVC air purifiers and so forth is the thing to do to add extra air change rate. So I put up some of the HEPA filters that are uh, offered nowadays. Uh, the typical aluminum separator type HEPA filter, as you can see at 2000 CFM or 500 feet per minute, which is typical HVAC velocity, um, 1.35 inches would be uh, quite a bit for a typical air handler. Plus that's clean. So you'd want to have at least probably two and a half inches dirty. Uh, new V-Bank air filters, you can get one at 2000 CFM at 0.83, which gets it much more reasonable. And again, a much more low energy type factor. So um, you have a lot of choices in the air filtration field. Make sure that you are looking at a good quality, newer technology product. Uh, make, if you can, make sure you're using a MERV A rated filter and that way you're getting your efficiency and keep it above MERV 13, which is what the recommendations pretty much through the industry are. So I think with that, that is it. And so I will, I can go back and share it. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Mindy Espinoza, who will talk about IAQ solutions for HVAC systems. Uh, before, thank you very much, Alan. That was uh, good information. It goes right in, in line with a lot of what, um, what we'll share about UV. So thank you very much for that. Uh, the uh, first thing I want to say before I start any presentation is always, you know, we, we, are, we exist in a great industry where we're all trying to do the right thing. And, uh, you know, we've all learned from someone. So if there's anything you hear during my presentation that sounds like something conflicting or something I could use a little more information on, please feel free to reach out. Um, you know, I don't want to go about being wrong for the next 30 years of my career. So uh, if you hear anything, please let me know. Um, that being said, uh, I'll go ahead and advance forward here. So um, as Ellen mentioned, when we are uh, talking about, you know, the different particle sizes of air contaminants and the different filtration levels, um, I won't go too far into this because we've already really covered it, but um, there are different sizes in microns of different particles. So bacteria are on the larger size, uh, viruses are a little bit on the smaller size, um, ranging anywhere from, you know, the 0.01 to 1, uh, 0.1 to 0.15 range in size. Um, he had also uh, mentioned the transmission via aerosolized uh, meteor, via uh, aerosolization or um, airborne. So there's a little bit of a difference in the way that all pathogens are uh, spread. And as anybody that's turned on the news, give it a day and then there's different and new information. So that's just the nature of coming into this new world of um, understanding this virus. So 
just to touch on really quickly um, what we're talking about here. So uh, there are several different types of coronaviruses. Um, the ones, the top four, this is straight from the CDC website. Uh, the top four are pretty common. They're kind of, uh, you know, common cold type issues um, that many of us have experienced in the past at some point, likely. Uh, and then the other human coronaviruses of which SARS-CoV-2 is one. So um, SARS-CoV-1, that was about 2003, 2004. Uh, we encountered that. Uh, MERS has um, come and gone from the Middle East um, since about that time uh, to the present time. And then SARS-CoV-2, the novel coronavirus, or uh, the one that causes COVID-19 that we're most familiar with right now. It's important to understand that there are different types and that, um, you know, they behave differently. The property, properties of those viruses are different. Um, and even between SARS-CoV-1 and CoV-2, we're, we're seeking to research and understand CoV-2 as well as we do CoV-1 now. Um, initial test reports indicate that a lot of the data that was being used to try to combat SARS-CoV-2 um, was, you know, based on SARS-CoV-1. And a lot of it, part, particle size is very close. Um, you know, a lot of the way that this virus behaves is similar. So the good news is, is we got that little bit of a head start from what we do know from SARS-CoV-1. Uh, but we do also have a lot to learn about SARS-CoV-2, so important things to know. Um, one of those things is transmissibility. So airborne is different than aerosolized, is different than um, surface, is different than all that. So um, a truly airborne viral particle, in the case of COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, um, based on the data from SARS-CoV-1 and current data, can be in, in a pretty wide range array of sizes, but the mean size is about 0.082 to 0.094 microns. So um, that's pretty, pretty small when we're talking about it. And so depending on where that is, where that size is, or where the virus is in its cycle of replication or transmission, and then how it's transferred, aerosolized or airborne, is really going to make a huge difference. So um, you know, it's really important that we utilize the technologies that we have through filtration, um, MERV filtration, HEPA filtration, etc. And also um, UV has been proven to be effective in the use against uh, coronavirus and other viruses. And then just uh, real quick, this is kind of probably displaying pretty small on your screens. Uh, this is from the uh, ASHRAE Fundamentals, Chapter 11, ASHRAE Handbook. But it talks about a variety of different types of pathogens and then the route of transmission. Um, so we have some aerosolized, some airborne, um, and then how they're transmitted. And I just wanted to, to mention, it's important to note that the conversations we're all having now are very important to coronavirus. They're also important to viruses and bacteria that we've seen in the past. So, um, you know, we're, we're all on the forefront of understanding how we proceed with caution in the future about how to prevent um, situations like we've encountered now. So with regard to UV light, um, UVC light has been used in the HVAC industry and in others for many, many years. Um, early uh, municipal water systems, like in 1908, I believe it was, the first municipal water system was treated with UV light. So you encounter, you know, many of our water systems today are utilizing UVD, UVC to disinfect. So it's just important to note that UV light is being utilized in various mechanisms and um, that it's out there already. So we might be a little bit more familiar with it than we, than we even realize that we are. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. It's still important in the treatment of, you know, in coil cleaning applications um, and important even for IAQ and pathogen control in coil cleaning applications. Because for IAQ to be possible, we do need to reduce the amount of mold that's going into an airstream. Um, and we need to reduce the biofilm growth that will improve energy, reduce maintenance costs, but also very importantly, increase the indoor air quality and reduce our risk of growing other things on there too. Uh, that biofilm provides a really nice breeding ground for a lot of different types of bacteria as well as molds. So we've been using it and we, as we continue to use it, it will still be important for that use. Most UV systems in use today are installed downstream of the cooling coil on the drain pan side um, because most were intended for cooling coil cleaning. Um, those that we do have out there that are uh, in place for airstream disinfection specifically 
are being utilized um, typically, if it's located in an air handler, we recommend that you do it downstream of the cooling coil. So you can capitalize on the benefits of cleaning that coil and airstream disinfection as well. Important, uh, as we heard in the last presentation, to note that um, caution should be taken if UV lamps are utilized in the filter cabinet so that either uh, you're utilizing a filter that has some resistance to UV degradation, um, and there are those out there, or you're utilizing, uh, we can provide clips or um, shields that go on the back of the lamps that prevent that lamp from shining on the filter and, and it will shine downstream so it's not directly irradiating that filter bank. Uh, you can install anywhere really in the system though. There are other technologies that you need to um, take care not to install in certain locations with regard to filtration or air distribution devices. Um, these can be installed anywhere in the system where we can provide uh, safeties, so where we can control who's accessing the lamps and what's being directly irradiated by the lamps. So what is UV light? So we all are very familiar with the UVA and UVB. Um, I, uh, I have to use sunblock virtually every day. I live in Montana, so I don't get a lot of sun. So, But the, uh, the sun is constantly giving out UVA, UVB, and UVC rays. Uh, as it does so, uh, the ozone layer is blocking most of the UVA and UVB and all of the UVC rays that are coming down uh, toward us. So how this really plays a role in how effective UVC is and the germicidal properties of UVC is that because of this fact that the UVC is not entering our, our atmosphere, we are not you know, developing any natural defenses against it. So viruses, bacteria, molds, they have not developed any natural defense against this UVC light. So it makes it a very effective means of, um, you know, germicidal irradiation. How it works, it destroys DNA in the cells and it's optimum at the 254 nanometer range. Um, through tests, we're, we're really seeing more, or we know more that it's more about 260 nanometers, but what we're able to kind of control and rein in, so to speak, into, the, into UVC lamps is the 254 nanometer wavelength. There are some technologies out there that are being provided at a lower wavelength, um, and those technologies can be ozone producing. So it's important to note that the 254 nanometer is not ozone producing. So um, there are technologies that are, but this is not one of them. So the UVC um, alters the DNA or RNA of a microorganism. So the, the Cliff Notes ver version, um, you have a DNA strand or an RNA strand of a pathogen. Uh, in order to reproduce, that DNA or RNA needs to be able to be intact and able to bind with the DNA of the host. So uh, the UV causes um, in DNA, DNA, the thymine, or in RNA, the uracil, to bind with itself. So it creates what's called a dimer and makes, think of a zipper that's unable to zip up because some of the links are broken. It creates that scenario where it's unable to zip. So uh, when you have a broken piece of RNA or DNA that's viral, it can't link with your DNA and then create um, you know, illness, it, it can't start the processes. And as a virus relies almost entirely upon its host for its reproduction, it's really important to disrupt that cycle. So it damages the DNA or RNA. In the case of uh, coronavirus, we're looking at a single-stranded uh, RNA virus, so it's, it would be more along this, this line. So that's how UV works on it. Dosage is very critical for the application of UV light. So dosage is the intensity times the time. So anyone who's ever applied coil cleaning product, um, it sits across from the coil, irradiates the coil 24-7, 365. You have, this part of the equation is gigantic. When we're talking about airstream disinfection, this part, the time becomes very, very small. We're passing a volume of airflow through and we may have only 0.25 seconds or less to inactivate that the virus in that portion of airflow. So we have to increase the intensity. So for a coil cleaning application, the intensity can be very small. For disinfecting, we need to increase this intensity. 
So that intensity is a factor of the lamp output, standard or high output lamp, and the quantity of lamps. So in the case of airstream disinfection, we put a high volume of high output lamps in the airstream. And the dosage is required to uh, deactivate or inactivate, or some will hear quote unquote kill, um, to eliminate the pathogen's ability to reproduce vary on, depending on the pathogen. So, you know, knowing what the goal is, do we want a one log reduction, which is 90%, two log, three log, et cetera. And then understanding what types of pathogens we have are pretty important. Um, so various types of UV can inactivate, but that intensity varies. So um, this is just an example of a standard output versus a high output lamp of the same size. And you look at the UVC watts and the intensity at one meter and the intensity at one meter is over double the intensity in that high output lamp. So it's an important part of the dosage. Intensity is in microwatts per centimeter squared. And just to give you an idea of where we are with different dosages, um, so for the, um, some will say like a D90 activation rate for influenza A requires 4,558 microwatt seconds per centimeter squared. As a comparison, coronavirus is over just over 1,200. So uh, coronavirus is actually easier to inactivate due to um, its uh, makeup and how it, how it operates. So um, as a comparison to that mold, as I was talking about earlier, we, we shine that light on the coil for a long, long time. But Aspergillus niger, or black mold, requires 330,000 microwatt seconds. So there's, a, there's some comparison for, for what we have out there and a wide range of, of different types of bacteria as well that we will encounter in our, in our day to day. So, uh, so just how UV can be installed, you can install it in an air handler or rooftop unit or air distribution duct. Um, we're getting really crafty and creative in all the ways that we can install it because <laughs> as was alluded to earlier, um, we can't put, you know, HEPA filters or OPA filters in rooftop units that were made for a certain, a given airflow. And also size is, is pretty important, how much size we have to work with. So, um, you know, putting a, an array of UV lamps within a rooftop or an air handler or mounted in a duct um, is something that we can calculate the intensity required and then be able to provide a solution for um, disinfecting a space. and also can be used in conjunction with other air purification systems. Um, this is a sample of a, a air purification system utilizing UV in a titanium dioxide panel um, that's at a low pressure drop, which in this kind of a configuration, you're not only reducing pathogens, so you're eliminating, you can eliminate or inactivate viruses and bacteria with the UV, but you can also reduce uh, VOCs and uh, you know, odors, contaminants that produce odors within the airstream as well. So there are different ways that UV can be applied on its own or in conjunction with other air purification systems. Um, UV being not a particulate filter, I want to make sure everybody is very aware of that. <laughs> we can't have rocks flying at lights. Um, we need to make sure that we have, you know, Mervate or greater upstream of the UV lamp system so that we can make sure to catch some of those large particulate pieces and components, so. And this is just an example, you know, of that same type of a system. So contaminated air, UV lamps, um, and then different types of filtration installed in line with it. Um, I guess the, the biggest takeaway is that it's, oops, it's a uh, method to be able to um, use in conjunction with other systems without adding pressure drop to a system and with a high level of scalability and flexibility where we can achieve rates of 99.99995 or greater um, efficiency in eradicating uh, different pathogens. So I get auctioneer trying to get in in 15 minutes and <laughs> got it. Uh, and we'll pass it off to uh, Bill Gray with Global Plasma. Thank you very much, Mindy. As, as, excuse me, Bill, as a reminder, um, please, if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat so that we can hopefully get go through and, uh, and answer some of these questions after Bill's presentation. Thank you. Okay, something's happening where it's moving through automatically. Okay, um, Global Plasm Solutions. 
uh, it's a manufacturer of an air purification product known as needlepoint bipolarization. Um, you may have heard of bipolar ionization, uh, which is a tube type product normally uh, sometimes called corona discharge or dielectric discharge. Uh, needlepoint bipolarization is a technology that uses um, carbon fiber. We charge the air electrically, creating positive and negative ions uh, without the production of ozone. Uh, there's a lot of um, mention in ASHRAE's uh, COVID-19 uh, response uh, that you really have to be careful when you are applying uh, bipolarization products uh, because you don't want to produce ozone. So that is one thing you really have to pay attention to. Needlepoint or GPS products, needlepoint bipolarization um, has products that we have been certified to UL 2998, uh, which is uh, UL's zero ozone standard. So uh, when you're looking at our technology, it is a uh, auto cleaning product. Uh, it is a product that you set it and forget it. Uh, there's no replacement parts, no tubes, uh, and very effective. Okay, so what we're working with is ionization. Ions occur naturally in nature. At high elevation, you're going to have anywhere from 5,000 to 20,000 ions per cubic centimeter in the atmosphere. And what happens as you come down in elevation, you're coming in contact with more pollution, uh, higher populated areas. As you come down into an area that you might be sitting today, outside you may have less than 200 ions per cubic centimeter in the, in the uh, atmosphere. As you come inside and you have no ionization products in your air handling unit or furnace, uh, you're going to have probably less than 100 ions per cubic centimeter uh, due to the fact that you have filtration and duct work. Um, what we are doing is generating or artificially generating the ionization, the same ionization that you have at, at elevation, uh, but we want to produce maybe 1,500 to 2,000 ions per cubic centimeter to do a good job with your indoor air pollution. So ions will have about 60 seconds of life. So when you're looking at a duct system, uh, it's important to understand the size of the system that you have. Uh, if you figure that you have a, uh, a larger system that may be 500 feet long, um, 1,000 feet per minute, you probably have 30% uh, or 50% of the life left of that ion to do the work in the space for you. So what we do is our technology is capable of reducing particulate through agglomeration. We're gonna talk in detail about that. Uh, we are re controlling odors, the VOCs. Uh, we'll get into that and pathogen control. Uh, and then we are able to um, also sanitize the coils by uh, not allowing the biofilm to build up, or uh, we actually can break down the scaling to make coils more efficient as well. Okay, when you look out the window on a, on a sunny day, you see, you see that uh, glare, that sunbeam coming in. All of those sunbeam, all, all of the, that sunbeam is basically reflecting off billions of particles. I like to say that there's three different types of particles that we're looking at right now. Particles that are large enough to be circulated by the air currents, be brought back to the system filter and are captured by that system filter. There's other particles that are so small, uh, they're still, but they're still able to be moved by the air currents, but once they get to that filter, they're gonna pass right through that filter. Then there's that submicron particle that's just stratified. There's not enough surface area to move it. Uh, so it just hangs there. You could have a MERV 13, 14, 15 filter in your system, and it's just not going to uh, be able to move that back to the system filter to capture. So what we're doing is called agglomeration. Agglomeration is what we are doing by sending positive and negative ions out into the space. Um, 
the ions are giving up their charge to the particles. And now we have positive and negative particles that are oppositely charged. They will attract to each other uh, and they will grow those particles in sizes, in size. And eventually those particles that were small enough uh, to pass right through the filter, eventually they would become large enough to be caught by that system filter and filtered out. Uh, the submicron particles that are just stratified are growing in size. Eventually, they'll be have enough surface area to be moved by the air currents, and over a period of time, uh, they will possibly be caught by that system filter. So, it's important to eliminate those particles from our breathing zone because those uh, particles will carry uh, the pathogens, viruses, mold spores, asthma, and allergy triggers. So we've done some testing um, at Blue Heaven Technologies, which is a certified uh, filter testing lab that does certifies a lot of MERV ratings for manufacturers. And we went in there with a MERV 8 filter with our technology. And we wanted to see how that compared to a MERV 13 filter without our technology. And what we found is that after 16 hours of operation, that MERV 8 filter actually exceeded the performance of that MERV-13. Um, through the agglomeration process, that MERV-8 filter continuously, uh, the, in that chamber, uh, the agglomeration process uh, actually made the particles larger that could eventually be caught by that MERV-8 filter. The MERV-13 filter, after 34 minutes of operation, could not capture any more of those smaller particles that were just passing right through. Uh, so, uh, here you can use a uh, lower MERV rated filtering, filter with a lower pressure drop, uh, less expensive filter, uh, longer equipment life, um, better system performance, plus you get the advantage of better indoor air quality on the inside. Um, the National Research Council of Canada also did a study where they were vetting our technology. What they found is that a MERV-12 filter had the same efficiency or effectiveness as a MERV-16 filter. That's through that agglomeration process. So there is, this is also a study uh, that was done back in 2005 by the um, Department of Environmental Health, the University of Cincinnati. They wanted to see the effect of ionization on particulate with mass with a uh, uh, that medical uh, people use. So they had a particle generator, they had a uh, ion generator, and what they did is they had a dummy that had a, a mask on it, and it was hooked up to uh, some particle counters. And what they found is that after uh, ionizing the air, the enhancement factor of the N95 mask, which we all know of today, uh, has been increased by almost 50%. The surgical mask, the efficiency of that is almost increased by 200%. Then that dust mist respirator that uh, we buy at Home Depot and we wear to sweep out the garage or uh, work in the wood shop, that's increased that by over 3,000%. So here we get into how we handle VOCs. We do a good job in reducing VOCs, which are the odors that we are dealing with. Now, every VOC has an electron volt potential. The electron volt potential is amount of energy that you would apply to that VOC in order to break the molecular bond. Once that molecular bond is broken on that VOC, it would become one or a combination of four things. Carbon dioxide, nitrogen, water vapor, or oxygen. Gases that are prevalent in our atmosphere and harmless to us. So uh, this is just a short list of VOCs, but there's a limitation here, and that is any VOC that has an electron volt potential less than 12, uh, we will be able to convert. Anything above that, we do not touch. We don't touch that because uh, if we oxidize oxygen, which is O2, it would become O3, which is ozone. Um, therefore, um, 
we don't produce ozone. Where the other technologies that I mentioned earlier, like the corona discharge tube, um, that has an inner filament, it's got a glass tube, and then it's got an outer filament. You have to, you have to generate electricity with that inner filament, it's got to generate enough electricity so it gets that glass tube to conduct electricity in order to complete the circuit with the outer filament um, to generate the ionization that they are producing. So they have to put enough energy to that where they are exceeding um, that threshold of that 12.07 where they will create ozone. So this is just a real short list. That, that was just a real short list that we were looking at um, of the VOCs. However, uh, we've got lists of 550 different VOCs uh, that you can cross-reference if you know what you're dealing with. Now this is showing you, it just shows you uh, what happens when uh, a pathogen is exposed to a technology. It basically breaks down the RNA, DNA cell structure of that pathogen uh, and the hydrogen is removed. Now, when it comes to viruses, uh, which is non-living, what we're doing uh, is going out there on that um, COVID-19, and we are breaking down the RNA fatty cell membrane, and we, we're inactivating it. So here's some test data uh, that we have had tested in different labs. Uh, you can see E. coli, C. diff, neurovirus, MRSA. You can see the times of exposure, the kill or the inactiv inactivation rates, and you can see the ion concentration. Remember I said we want to maintain maybe 1,500 to 2,000 ions per cubic centimeter. Now, COVID-19, okay, uh, we had tested um, recently our partner, Aviation Clean Air, <clears throat> who deals a lot in aircraft, got us into a level three lab that has COVID-19. Um, what the government helped them get them in there because they want to get it into aircraft or uh, into the, and get the airlines back in the air flying safely. So the 27,000 ions per cubic centimeter that you see there, uh, that's at a much higher density than what we would actually see in our occupied spaces. Um, because that's what we would typically see in a aircraft with the high velocity systems. Uh, but you can see there was a 99.4% inactivation rate after 30 minutes. Today we are doing more testing in that same lab, um, which is innovative bioanalysis uh, with airborne COVID um, at similar levels that you would see in a occupied space, like 1,500 to 2,000 ions per cubic centimeter. Um, human coronavirus, you see that. We had that tested before we got into this other lab. And after 60 minutes, uh, we had a 90% inactivation rate at 1,500. So as you go up that scale, we are going to be, uh, as you get up to 2,000, you're gonna have a much uh, better inactivation rate. Okay, so we also uh, mount our technology upstream of the evaporator coil, uh, which will enable us to really improve the efficiency of the systems uh, by breaking down that biofilm or not allowing it to build up and also break the scaling, break down the scaling to reduce the static pressure drop through the evaporator coil. Uh, so you can see some of the different, <coughs> different uh, amounts of scaling that you would have on there, uh, which will do a good job of really improving the efficiency of the system. And you can see uh, that there was some sort of mold, and this is a North Carolina hospital. On the left-hand side, they had some sort of mold built up, and then we had our technology in there three weeks after, and you can see it on the right-hand side. It's different angles, but it's the same coil. Getting into some of our technology and our products, um, we have a number of auto cleaning products. Um, the product that you see on the left-hand side, that would be our GPS FC 
48 AC, which is a uh, DC product. It's good for up to 4,800 CFM. That can be installed on multiple different types of systems, small pack rooftops, fan coils, upflow furnaces, um, anything that you could fit the unit into. Um, it's auto cleaning once every three days. The wiper blade is going to be activated. Uh, it's gonna go back and forth about three times, knocking off any particulate that would build up on it. This is a DC product. Uh, so we have one side that is DC positive, the other side is DC negative, uh, and those emitters are tipped off in carbon fibers. Those, the particulate of the opposite charge will be attracted to those emitters. Uh, so if you didn't have that auto cleaning uh, function, eventually there would be enough particulate that would build up on those emitters to insulate them. So once every three days, we're activating that wiper blade and it knocks off any particular that would build up on there. So this is, this is a, a keeping it at spec 24 seven, 365. So in the middle, you see that round unit, that is a duct mount unit of the same size or the same output, uh, it's just duct mounted. Uh, one four inch round hole, uh, four zip screws, and you wire it in. And, and the DC products that we're showing you here right now are um, universal voltage. So we can take 24 through 240 volts through just a single pair of wires and we're good to go. 24 through 240 and it's all micro amps that they, that they operate on. Um, down at the bottom, that little thing coiled up, that is called a I, the GPS I rib. Uh, that is a little flexible ribbon that is not auto cleaning, uh, but it will fit into a lot of applications such as uh, P-Tacks, window shakers, uh, high wall ductless, anywhere where you have a really tight fit. Okay, then this is our, this is our um, flagship product. This is called our GPS iMod. Uh, this is a modular unit uh, that would stretch across the width of the evaporator coil um, and it, um, it does a great job of sanitizing that coil before it actually goes into the space. It's a modular unit, as I mentioned. Um, we can power 50 feet of total bar uh, with one power supply that only draws 15 watts of power. Um, and that 50, 50 feet of bar could be four 12 and a half foot bars in total tied into one power supply, uh, which could be sanitizing uh, 40, 50, 60,000 CFM of air before it goes into the space to sanitize it as well. Um, this can be operated on uh, from 24 volts, 110, 208, 230 with just a little slide switch on the inside. And this is, this is one of the products we did have tested to uh, UL867-2007, the ozone chamber test. And the results of that, uh, we produced less than 0 0.001 parts per million of ozone. And with that, we are now certified with this technology, with this product to UL2998, their zero ozone standard. And with that, UL issues a little green sticker that you see there on the left-hand side, uh, so that's, that's validated for zero ozone emission. So this is basically what it looks like when it's installed. Um, we require one bar for every six inches of height. Um, it does a great job of, again, sanitizing that coil before it goes into the space to sanitize it. You can see the power supply, uh, how it would possibly be mounted on a uh, indoor central station unit. One question we always get, how do you know it's working? Well, there's many different ways of measuring what's going on uh, with our technology. First off in the left hand upper, you see the air ion counter. That's a portable uh, handheld air ion counter uh, made by Alpha Labs. You can use that to measure the ion density either 
in the occupied space or at the unit. In the space, you would use the two million version and at the, um, at the unit, you could use it for commissioning or for troubleshooting and that you would use the 200 million version. Bottom left-hand side, uh, you see that X-Tech, that is a laser particle counter. That's something that you could use to measure the particulate that is present before you start up the product. And then you can go in there six or seven days later after you've had a good chance for having agglomeration to take place. Uh, and you'll see a, a real reduction in the particulate load. Uh, up on the top right-hand side, you see that GPS ID tech that's attached to the ION, uh, the IMOD bar. Uh, that is going to actually sense the electrical field that the IMOD is producing. So when it starts up, it's a set of normally open contacts that can actually be um, tied into your building management system or back to your power supply. So when you have enough of an electrical field, it says the ions are being generated. Uh, moving down that little black thing in the center, that is called an eye measure. Uh, that will actually measure the ion density in the space and can be tied into your building management system uh, through a zero to 10 volt signal. On the right hand side, the vertical unit with the mesh on it, that is the same as the one on the left-hand side, but uh, it's used in the duct or it's used in the unit to measure the ion density at the unit or in the duct. Uh, then we have VOC sensors, um, either uh, the BAPI uh, TVOC sensor, or this is the ion science sensor that you see here in the center. Uh, the ion science center sensor is what we would use before and after, if you want to measure before and after ionization. Um, or the BAPI sensor would be the TVOC sensor that you put in the space to tie into the building management system if you just want to measure the VOCs that are in the space. Then over on the right hand side in the bottom you have what's called a uh, laser particle sensor uh, counter. Uh, this is a device that can be tied into your building management system as well and it's going to measure the, the PM 2.5 and also the PM 10 that is present. Um, you have a probe that can be mounted in the return duct, or you don't have to use a probe and it can be used as a uh, measuring the actual um, particulate in the, in the space. Again, many different types of products can be tied into the building management system. So that is it for my presentation. And I guess, Bob, you can take it from here. Yep. Um, thank you. I'd like to thank all the speakers. And I, I know we ran a little bit over. Uh, we do have um, some questions that, that did come in into the chat. And at this point in time, I'd like to, um, if for those of you that do need to leave us, that, that's fine. Um, but we'll hopefully, uh, Ashley, do we have some time to answer some of these questions? I mean, I'm in no rush. We can definitely stay on that way. It's recorded too. So that way any questions that were asked um, can, can be answered. So feel free to, uh, I'm going to be here. So feel free to answer the questions. Okay. So the first question, um, I think Mindy, this would be for you. Um, do you have any comments or recommendations on UV for lights in an office environment for disaffecting surfaces? Sure. Um, so UV FAR is a, uh, a slightly different technology than the germicidal radiation we talked about at that 254 nanometers. It's a little higher wavelength that's um, a little bit less, uh, a little bit, I guess you could say, quote unquote, safer. Um, the problem with the FAR UV is it hasn't been entirely validated. And so um, based on the current documentation, there's a, an exact exposure to UV, um, any UVC that is allowable. And so um, some new technologies are proposing that, that far UV be used in a space and just continuously irradiate that entire space all the time. So those dosages might exceed what's recommended. So um, it's used with caution. There's a different technology that can sometimes be confused with that. And that's called high space UV. And you can use a germicidal wavelength um, in the high space because there are 
there are important, important reasons to do that with the way that air mixes within a space um, to be able to irradiate at that high level. Um, as we all sit in a room, you know, almost all the offices and everywhere we go is a mixed air system. We're not usually in a laminar system like in a lab. So um, the high space UV, it's different than the far UV, but is also located at the higher spaces of, of the environment and can be used not shining directly on on the you know people within the space. Does that answer it? Thank you on that. Uh, next question from Frank um, regarding elevator cabs, um, disinfection and purification panel guidance. Does any of the panel have any um, experience with that? Uh, we are currently working with a couple different elevator manufacturers uh, developing uh, a technology that they can use. Uh, we've, we do have NDAs with those at the moment, so it's nothing I can really speak to, but uh, it is something that we have in development. And there's, there's a, uh, similarly, I can't speak in too many details, but um, at a very high level, Utilizing UV for surface disinfection has been done for a very long period of time. And so um, with elevators and other uh, spaces that are commonly shared, uh, as long as the UV is accompanied by an on-off uh, on switch or something, a safety switch to allow for it to turn off, the high levels of UV to turn off when it, the space is occupied, you can utilize UV for disinfection of common spaces. Okay, on the same note, same question, does it have to be installed on the air side or can it be installed by printers and elevator cabs? Uh, that I'm not involved with, so I'm not sure how it's being applied. Okay. Um, Alan, this one's for you, is 97% COVID-19 kill realistic, oh, I'm sorry, it's for Mindy, with UVC in a single air cycle or would it require several air changes? Uh, it is realistic depending on the air site application and the velocity. Um, so if any UV supplier just gives you a flat yes without understanding uh, the reflectivity of the surfaces within the um, you know, delivery device or uh, the delivery system you're using, the dimensions and the velocities, um, all of those things will impact the uh, efficiency or the um, inactivation ratios, but yes, it is realistic to uh, to do not with a very small amount of UV irradiation, though. Okay, uh, Alan, this one's for you. The public space gathering areas, airflow impact on air purifiers with HEPA filtration strategy levers to consider with placement. Well, um, yeah, we've done a lot of talking about that because uh, as we mentioned earlier, quite often the HVAC system doesn't offer enough air change rate to do really effective cleaning. Um, and we sort of prefer, if you look at the um, uh, settling rate of some of those very small particles, uh, we prefer to get air patterns going in a direction. So pulling from one side of the room, maybe pushing from the other and so forth to keep things moving and getting into the air purifiers. Some of the small air purifiers that just sit on the floor just have a little circular pattern to them. So they may not have the, um, they'll certainly give you the air change rates, but they may not have the air patterns that is optimal for collecting particles. The second part of that question, um, can the Blue Haven lab report be shared on the Yes, it can. Okay. Right, can it be shared on the screen? Or can I share it via email? I think, um, Ashley, if we, we get a hold of it, we can post it. Yeah, we can, we can send it out with the, the recording. Um, next question, I'd like to hear more details regarding the ability of UV to kill pathogens in a single layer cycle looking across a spectrum of UV products, I've not seen one that measures kill times in less than a number of seconds. Um, we're able to provide models uh, that show, um, and in many cases you'll have a volume of airflow that passes through the UV lights 
in less than, you know, around 0.25 seconds or in that ballpark, but most often definitely under one second. So I can certainly provide modeling for specific situations. Um, if those asking the question are interested, we can set up something to show that. Okay. And uh, next question, are there location specific solutions that can add additional measures and common spaces such as elevators, stairs, hallways, kitchenettes, et cetera, that would be supplemental to the air duct systems? Also, are there systems that can work for spaces that do not have air ducts for cooling or heating? Well, any of the Goloplasm Solutions products can be used in the, the air ducts, whether they're in the units or whether they are in the ducts. Uh, however, we do not have a portable unit at this time if you don't have ductwork. Uh, we are working on that and uh, it's something that we will have in the near future. UVDI does have um, portable in-space units uh, and as well that circulate air through HEPA filtration and UV lamps as well as in-space surface disinfection solutions. Okay, I think that is all the questions that have been listed in the chat. Um, I'd like to thank our presenters for giving us their time and uh, expertise today. And I think that will be the end of it. Good, thank you. Thank well, thank you very much to all that attended. Thanks for yep. Thank you everyone for joining today and I appreciate the panel and Joy for hopping on and hope everyone stays safe and please let us know if you can think of anything after this, but we'll work on getting this together for you guys to send out. Good. Thanks. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thanks Ashley. I right. take care.